Hello, happy January again. My name is Anne and you're watching Art on the Creek. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have to keep saying happy January because I kind of can't believe it's here. 2024, my gosh, I remember when 1983 was far away. And uh, in fact, that's the year that my mother made this photo album for me. Uh, the year we graduated from high school, my brother was a couple years older than I, but he got one too. They all have the same pictures in them. They're pictures of us as kids and things we did together. So I'm really grateful that my mom took the time to do this. I'm, I grew up with photo albums and pictures and digital images are so easy to have and I just have entirely too many because film isn't precious. You can just delete what you don't like um, and you can edit things so easily. So I treasure my photo albums and I still have photos printed of some of my favorite pictures because for me it's that tactile memory of being able to remember where that photo is in that album. So today dig out your photo albums or scroll through your phone and get a favorite picture. You know of course you could use digital whatever you like. I want to go over just a little bit of my tips for painting children in watercolor. So get your photos out, decide what you want to paint and meet me back here. So here is the photo album that uh, my mom gave me. And like I said, she gave my brother one also. Uh, it has uh, got a few pictures missing because I took them out and I stupidly didn't put them back. But um, I don't remember this day, but I love that picture. I'm reading books and I'm, I'm really not wanting my picture taken. I just want my mom to read a book to me. But this picture here, I remember I was one year, four months old, and my brother and I were going down our front walk on our uh, from our duplex home in Denver on Perry Street. We're riding out to the sidewalk, which seemed like so far away. And uh, Dale is on a, some kind of a, a choo-choo train ride on toy, which I wish we still had. That thing looks so cool. Um, and Lucinda, my beloved Lucinda, she, I rode her every single day. Um, and then again, when we moved in 1968 to a, a home that wasn't a duplex, I rode her there too. And I loved her so much. She stayed in my room with me. And I rode her until the wheels literally came off. And I was so sad when we finally had to say goodbye to Lucinda. Her head flopped over to the side and we didn't have any more fur on her at all. I had just petted her and loved her. I loved that fur right off of her. So that's Lucinda. And I don't know why I named her Lucinda, uh, but I've always loved donkeys. And uh, she is indeed a donkey. So what I wanted to uh, to share with you here today are my tips for uh, for drawing something like this. I, I know a lot of you out there might have a favorite childhood memory or a childhood picture or a picture of your grandkids, a picture of your own children, or just a child in general and uh, or or a portrait. Something, some subject that you've had your eyes on but have been a little bit intimidated to do. I'm going to hopefully today break it down for you in a way that um, maybe you'll finally go ahead and try that uh, piece of art that you have put off for whatever reason. The paper that I'm using today is 100% cotton B watercolor paper and that is my very first tip to you. Use 100% cotton paper. I've got a cold press here but it's a very fine texture and I think that that works very well with uh, with skin, with the softness of skin. For instance, if you're going to choose rough watercolor paper, I think that's a little bit better for something like landscapes um, or trees, something that has a lot of texture. I really feel like the hot press watercolor paper, hot press has a tendency to make things flat. I prefer that for uh, gouache or colored pencil. But if you're going to use a cold press watercolor paper, which you should, <laughs> to, make, uh, to make your portrait, make sure it's 100% cotton and make sure that that texture is fairly smooth. I really like this Be Creative watercolor journal for that reason. Uh, another really good one is the Hanamul cotton. Uh, also, 
the Fabriano, sorry, I couldn't think of the name, the Fabriano Artistico, all of those are really good. If you have a cotton paper that you love, though, go ahead. In fact, mention it in the comments. I am always looking for more uh, cotton watercolor papers that are budget-friendly. Some of the ones that I mentioned are not budget-friendly, um, but they're beautiful papers. So, uh, you know, whatever whatever you've got for a favorite, for right now, my favorite budget-friendly watercolor paper is the Bee Creative Journal, the, the Aqua Bee paper. Um, I also really like the Paul Rubens uh, Cold Press watercolor paper. Uh, I've recommended that one for my uh, beginner students before, but uh, this one definitely, the Bee watercolor paper, can recommend that as well. So that's the first tip, uh, taking your, uh, your paper in mind. Next tip I have for you is when you're doing your sketch, this is the second tip, remember that children are proportioned differently than adults. Uh, their heads are always a little bit rounder than adults. Their cheeks are fuller. Foreheads protrude forward a little bit more. The nose has a tendency to tip up and, and just stick out like a little button. Uh, everything about little kids is, uh, is cuter. I'm not talking about babies, infants, but I'm talking about toddlers. Um, you have a big bean-shaped body and uh, little stocky legs, typically chubby hands, chubby arms. These are the things that uh, you kind of want to remember when you're, when you're drawing your, uh, your figure because you want to get those proportions correct. In fact, when you're working with uh, drawing people, proportions are really what matters. Now, if you're going to deal with a toddler, the height of the head is really what matters. That's going to decide how, how you proportion everything else. So any, anything from a toddler to a small child is probably going to be four to five heads tall. When you get into uh, a lar an older child, like a, a later elementary school child, you can still do that uh, five heads. Um, but remember that when, you're, when your child is preschool and younger, that head is still a little bit larger. The eyes are larger, they're spaced a little bit farther apart, tummies are rounder. All of these kinds of uh, things are important to keep in mind. So remember your proportions. Uh, that is my second tip. And, you know, just use a pencil. You, uh, you can go in with the, with the colored pencil if you like, but uh, a pencil for me is just fine because uh, you're going to, chances are you'll have to end up erasing. Um, now, what I like to do, my third tip, is to save the face for the end. Uh, don't draw that uh, face in yet. Wait until you've got all the other elements in place. And if you're drawing, you know, a, a face that is, let's say you're doing a portrait and it's only the face, um, then I would go ahead and get the head shape in first and map out the placement of your eyes, nose, and mouth. And, um, you know, there are lines you can use. Remember that your the eyes are sisters. They're not twins. And uh, same thing with all of our facial features that we have two of. They're, they're never identical, identical. Um, you'll see a lot of... Uh, shorts and uh, quick lessons uh, to draw faces uh, and typically they will divide the face in half and uh, d then divide it uh, vertically into thirds so that you can get the nose, the, the mouth and the eyes and they will evenly space the eyes. Um, the eyes are typically spaced so that there is one eye width between the eyes. But you know that's, that's a standard uh, example of a human. Uh, when you're drawing your actual person, really pay attention to these curves and where things lie. So for instance, for me right now, I'm working on the eyes. Now I've got a very round forehead. And when I drew that, I felt like it was too round. I felt like it was just too much, but I wanted to go ahead and keep it. And sure enough, it turned out to be just right. So uh, putting a little button nose in and then really trying to get the curve of the mouth correct. And I've got my head tipped over there so that I can see really well. So I'm sorry, the focus might uh, pull out just a little bit and pay attention to my head. Sorry about that. Um, right there. <laughs> but what you want to do is have that eraser handy and erase gently. Um, if you have a kneaded eraser, those always work great. You can just tap things off or that uh, what I've got there is a white plastic eraser. And then I'm using a brush to brush away the crumbs because I want very little smudging and smearing. The chin, I had to rework a little bit because again, that's one of the sweet features of kids. Their little chins are a little bit rounder than an adult chin. So just if you can remember those tips about uh, placement and size of the facial features, that will really help you. And also notice in this photo, you can't see my neck at all. It's just chin and coat. So that's, um, 
that's something else to remember. Children's necks tend to be a lot shorter than an adult neck. So uh, when you're drawing, um, here we go, we're focusing now on the tummy. Now I'm looking at the coat and noticing that it pooches out on my chest area and then there's a bit of a crease right at my waist and then it comes down again over my tummy. So these are things to, uh, to keep in mind when, you are, uh, when you're painting and drawing your subject as a child. You want to make sure, uh, or rather your, your child's subject, you want to make sure that you have all of these soft, exaggerated, cute parts. <laughs> the parts that are proportioned differently than us as adults. You want to be sure and have those key uh, elements uh, in place. And then you can start painting. Now the paints that I'm using today are uh, Da Vinci watercolors and I like these in particular for painting portraits because skin tones, these, we have a lot of light that bounces off of our skin and that's what makes skin glowing and healthy and if we can replicate that in our paintings and not overwork them, that's what's going to give us a really good uh, rendition of a portrait and that's the other thing we want to be careful of another tip is to not overwork our painting uh, I borderline came really close to that on this one uh, so uh, beware of that one that's a really good a good thing to remember and uh, words that the artist needs to listen to herself <laughs> uh, I am mixing a gray here for the donkey um, I, again I'm leaving the face for last so I want to go ahead and put in the donkey first Part of that is because I want to get my contrasts right. Skin tone, when you mix it in your palette, it always looks just a little bit too intense for what you're going to paint. At least that's that's what I have found. Um, there's many different ways to mix skin tones. The, the way that I like to mix them is using the primary. So in this case, I'm using a Hansa Yellow Medium, an Alizarin Gold. And if you don't have that one, you can use Alizarin Crimson because sometimes I'll pop in some Quinacridone Red with that. And then a Cobalt Blue. So you can choose whichever colors you like to mix for your skin tone and uh, go from there. You just vary the percentages of those to kind of get exactly what you want. And then what I do is I water it down. So once you have your skin tone mixed, add some water to it. And uh, we're going to go in and try and keep those layers as sheer as possible. So that's, that's your next tip, or, but it, we're going to put it into practice a little bit later. What I'm doing here is uh, just filling in some of the shadows under Lucinda, uh, under me rather, and uh, picking up the darker portions of Lucinda. And then we can go on and paint the next section. Now that I've got Lucinda's body in, I think I wanna go ahead and add in the coat. Now what I'm doing is I'm establishing the other values in the painting so that I'll know, I'll have a better judge of where I wanna take that skin tone value to. I don't have the skin tone mixed yet, uh, but I just wanted to kind of try and get the rest of these values in so that I know what I'm dealing with. Um, I'm using cobalt blue, very light wash. Now in the photo, my coat has little flowers on it. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to uh, paint it a light blue and I'm leaving a lot of white space so that it could be interpreted as maybe a white coat in shadow. I'm mixing now uh, a little bit different mix. This is a phthalo blue mixed with burnt sienna because I'm trying to get that that kind of a dusty blue color on my snow pants. And um, I, it's just kind of a, a turquoisey blue that I ended up going for. I'm putting a little bit of cobalt in here to kind of neutralize it. And this is just the first wash of the pants. So what I wanna tell you about these tips here, when you're painting clothing, look at where the shadows are. Those are key areas that will give your, your subject uh, life and movement. Um, things like, uh, when you, well, when you look at your jeans, so if you're sitting down, look at the side of the knee of your jeans. You have some creases there. If uh, you're painting someone straight on, there are always creases right at the, the crotch and perhaps down uh, just over the shoe where the pants hang. Those kinds of folds in fabric are what tell us as viewers that there's a human form under there. So we want to pay attention to where those shadows are and how they fall. Now this technique here, what I'm doing is putting in the bases for those, uh, those creases in my pants and I am going in wet in wet. So that's another good tip for you is to, when you first do the clothes, pay attention to the shadows and go in using wet on wet techniques. When I did the coat, that was all wet on dry because I wanted to keep it very, very subtle. I might go in and darken those later, but uh, I might leave them the way they are. It's just a, a very subtle. I wanted to keep 
most of the uh, most of the focal points on my pants, Lucinda, and my face. So I wanted to keep that coat very, very pale in nature and because it's a white coat in the photo. So I didn't want to put too much color into that. This next tip is one that you can use for any painting whatsoever. When I mix this dark, this gray, I'm mixing cobalt and burnt sienna. You can also use ultramarine and burnt sienna. It really is a, just kind of a standard go-to mix for mixing darks or a gray or a black. I like to leave it a little bit not fully mixed on my palette because for me, then I can maybe pull from the top side of that puddle and pick a little more blue, pull from the bottom of the puddle, pick a little more brown, and that way I can get some real uh, soft gradient changes in, in my painting that, um, you know, otherwise are really, really very uh, difficult to kind of create on your own. I like to not fully mix the paints in my palette so that I can go ahead and get a lot of uh, texture in my paintings. For something like this, for a stuffed animal that has a lot of texture, uh, you can definitely do that and come up with a really good uh, dimension of color just by not mixing that mix <laughs> really thoroughly. Now as I'm uh, painting the mittens here, I, I want to use a different blue. So I'm not using the cobalt. What I'm using is that phthalo blue. I could have used the indigo or I could have added some indigo to the cobalt, but I chose to use the phthalo blue. I'm concentrating the pigment where the creases in the mittens are, and then I'm going to go back in with a wet brush and just kind of stir that up. Uh, right now I'm adding some gray to the white portions of the mittens, and then I'm going to pull that in with some water as well. So you can see here the brush is just wet, and I'm just stirring that pigment around, and that will help create a soft gradient. So remember that when you lay your pigment down, you can definitely come back in with a wet brush and soften those edges. That's always a good tip to use, no matter what you're painting. Another tip I can give you is to constantly assess your values in your painting. Now, I noticed that as soon as I got those mittens in, all of the, uh, the shadow definition in the jacket that I had just put on kind of got lost. So I need to go back and go over those with another wash. Again, this is a very dilute wash of that cobalt. I'm just going over the areas that I wanted the shadows to be and just kind of uh, giving them a little bit more attention. That will happen also in the pants uh, in the future here, but right now we're gonna go ahead and just accentuate the shadows on the jacket. Now, a lot of times when you're painting something in watercolor, your subject is white. So what we need to do is to look for those shadows. Uh, notice if they're warm shadows or cool shadows. Uh, some good colors to keep in mind to use for shadows on something white is uh, your gray mix, or you could use uh, Payne's gray neutral tint. You could certainly go in with some kind of a purple. A dioxazin purple works really well. Uh, sometimes you could use uh, moon glow. Something like that is a really good color for, for, sh for uh, folds and shadows. Uh, you could even go in with a very light pink, a quinacridone rose, or a very light yellow, uh, depending on the temperature of your shadow. So look at what your shadows look like on your white subject adjacent to the other things in your painting, and then decide from there what you'd like to, to, make, that, uh, to make that shadow from. Now I'm going ahead and painting the wheels on Lucinda, and uh, the facing edge of the wheel is a brighter red, the runner of the wheel, the part that uh, goes on the concrete uh, is, or the roller part, however you want to say that, that is a darker red. So for that, I'm mixing the alizarin crimson and a little bit of cobalt. The sides of the wheel were done in a quinacridone red. I'm also using that same red for her bridle. And I've added little suggestions of the other wheels on the far side, uh, just uh, because I'm not going to paint that dark of a shadow underneath it. And um, this photo was taken under really bright sunshine, and so the shadows are very intense. But I'm not going to uh, do the shadow that darkly under the, the donkey, so I wanted to make sure and include just a suggestion of those other wheels. I've got the yellow headband on her, and that was done with the Hansa Yellow Medium. And while we're here, since these areas adjacent to the eye are dry, I'll go ahead and use a very dark mix to uh, paint her eye on. And this is kind of fun. Whenever you're doing something, a stuffed animal or uh, something that doesn't have to be too lifelike, it really can look cartoony because, uh, in fact, it is. So um, that makes it a little bit easier on you as an artist uh, when you're trying to replicate something. We're just going in and painting her nostril here. And uh, I guess that's the other tip I want to give you. Make sure when you're adding details to something that the area adjacent to it is completely dry. 
Um, another tip I will give you is continually refer to your reference photo. You'll notice that uh, I'm checking there. I wanted to know if uh, Lucinda's mouth had a black border on her lips or if it was just all red felt that was glued in there. Now I'm putting the little attachments on the wheels and we'll do those in that same very dark mix. Now it's time to intensify some of these shadows. Now I've already gone under kind of where my hand is and uh, darkened the shadow on the donkey. And now I'm going to go in with that same mix that I have from my pants, um, although I'm using a thicker version of it. And I'm putting in all of these creases and folds in the pants. So right at first, it's going to look a little weird. This is, this is part of the hot mess stage. So that's my other tip. When you get to that hot mess, keep going because it just means you're not done. It's um, all watercolor goes through that phase. And uh, you just need to press on because it will, it will correct. You will get there. Uh, it's just a matter of not overworking it. That's the biggest, the biggest tip I can give you. So what I'm doing is uh, just trying to blend this out. Now I've got all of those crease lines in and now I'm going in with a very thin wash of the same paint and I'm kind of adding water to the pants here and really trying to touch all of those areas where I just added the creases. Part of it is because I want to make the value of the pants darker and I just want to get a basis in for where those fabric folds are. Um, they're going to be very subtle when we're done, not as pronounced as they are in the in the photo but I did want to make sure and have the creases in the right place. So this will help you to do that. Go ahead and uh, plan on adding more layers when you're working in watercolor. Another small suggestion I have for you when you're working on adding those shadows to clothing folds, don't be afraid to change your brush size. Uh, you might be better off using a much smaller brush. And I did go back and forth between the eight and the number two on the pants. I'm using a number 12 now to, uh, to paint in the, the hood and it's kind of got fur around the edge and I was debating with kind of trying to how to get some texture in here and I decided, you know, I'm just going to give it a faint gray and then blot off the extra. That's my other big tip. Don't be afraid to, to back off from an idea that's not working. If you catch something in watercolor soon enough when you are working on it, if you just don't think it's going to work and it's still wet, just go in with a clean paper towel or a rag and just blot that off. And so now I, I ended up blotting off a little bit too much of the shadow from the hood and I'm just going to kind of add that back in. And you'll see that thick line of pigment. And then I go back in with some water and kind of loosen it up here. And now again, I think I've got it just a little too intense. So I'm just blotting it off and then I can get it exactly the way I want it. So that's a really good technique for you in watercolor. And um, I think it's one that uh, has really served me well to try and just keep blotting off to, uh, to reduce the intensity of some pigment. You know, I want it to be there, but I just didn't want it to be that strong. So blotting off is a really good way to do that. Now I'm adding just a little bit more texture in the jacket. I'm uh, going with the elastic on the sleeves and just kind of trying to add the little puckers and, and uh, lines on the mittens here. So just finishing up some final details before we get on to the face. Before we move on to the face though, I did happen to notice that there's a really intense shadow uh, down the side and under my chin on my jacket. So I'm going to go ahead and go in with that dark mix. And what I'm doing is I'm just laying it over, kind of got a, the bow drawn from my, my jacket uh, where my hood ties here. Uh, it's just a kind of a doodle of a bow. It's nothing fancy because what I'm planning on doing is when I go in now with the water to kind of uh, distribute that pigment and make it a soft edge, I'm actually going to kind of erase the far side of the bow. I didn't want the bow too visible. I just wanted it to, uh, to just be there. Um, and again, by putting that thick line of pigment down, not too thick, but you know, a concentrated amount of pigment down and then coming back in with water, you can really create those soft edges. And uh, for shadows and things, that's just, uh, that's just the way to go. It's a really, really good tip for you to use. And you can use it in portraits, on uh, people, on clothing. You can use it in anything you paint at all put the line of pigment down and then come back with water to soften that edge. Now it's finally time to mix that color for the pigment. Now I'm using this alizarin gold. I've got a number two brush in my hand. And now I'm going to go next to that puddle and add just a little bit of the Hansa yellow medium. And I know that that's creating an orange and I want to go in very sparingly with that cobalt blue. So right away I've created a brown, but it's way too dark. So I'm going to add some more of the alizarin crimson. It's kind of like cooking. You just kind of adjust your spice uh, to suit your needs. Well, I'm adjusting the pigments to suit my needs. 
and now I'm going to go in with my spray bottle and really water that down. This is another thing why I think that having a white palette is so important because you can definitely uh, see the true version of your colors a little bit better. As I'm mixing it in the puddle there, you can see I added some more of the quinacridone red because I needed to pink it up just a little bit. And then I'm tweaking it again with some yellow. It's just a matter of uh, deciding what you need in your ratio. And uh, once I feel like I've got it the way I want it, I've rinsed my brush off so that I've got a very faint wash. I didn't really, I, I guess I kind of just dipped my brush in the water and blotted it off. I didn't want to remove the pigment completely. And that's going to be the first wash of the skin tone that I put down. Now another thing that I can tell you about kids is that in general their faces are uh, a little bit more pink, at least on, uh, on Caucasian children and lighter pigmented children. Uh, the faces tend to be a little bit more pink. Um, you can certainly, if your uh, subject has uh, a little bit more of a brown or cinnamon skin tone, you can definitely look very closely at those colors and see which colors lie underneath. Sometimes skin is olive toned, uh, sometimes it's got a pink tone underneath it, sometimes it has a yellow tone underneath it or a blue tone. So pay attention to those colors and the ratios because that is also how you're going to make your shadows. Um, if I were painting uh, someone with darker skin, you could still go in with that quinacridone rose and create that pink uh, for the cheeks. All you have to do is experiment and see what's going to work. Now what I'm doing is I'm mixing a little bit of purple. You would think that purple would not look good on a skin tone, but it really does uh, in this case because it is a perfect use for a shadow. You can use green, you can use purple. There's so many different colors you can use and uh, on any, any complexion, no matter how fair or how dark you've mixed that complexion, as long as, and this is just kind of my rule of thumb, as long as you have used three pigments to mix, then you can adjust that ratio and create your shadows and your highlights how you need them. Now for highlights, we're gonna do some lifting off. In fact, I've skipped ahead a little bit. I went ahead and blended the, uh, the elements of the quinacridone red that I had. I blended those in a little bit because I just wasn't feeling like it was quite the right tone. So I wanted to just blend that in. And again, all of this is wet on wet at this point. So you can really make those blends nice and soft. Now I'm coming in with a little bit more intense purple for these shadows on my forehead. Uh, underneath my nose, the cheeks, the chin, the eyes, all of the, anywhere where you see a crease or a shadow on the face. That's where I've adjusted the ratios so that it is uh, a little more heavy on that uh, cobalt blue, creating a nice little purple. So I can go down the side of the hood here and create that shadow, go under the chin, along the cheek line, in the hollows of the eyes, and now it's time to dry the face and assess where we've got the highlights and shadows. Now that the face is completely dry, before I go in and finalize the tones and curves and the highlights, I want to put the hair in. The hair is also a good point of contrast and I want to make sure that I have that in the way I want it before I finalize the way that I've got the skin shadowed, the shadows on the face rather. So I'm going in with pretty much, uh, it, I think it's raw sienna with just a touch of burnt sienna. My hair is kind of a blondy brown when I was a kid. And um, I just wanted to go in with the lighter color first and then come back with the burnt sienna. So I've just got a number two brush and I'm just kind of putting some wisps of hair down. This is so small. Um, I don't have a hair tutorial for you yet. Uh, I might later in the year, but right now in my library as I'm recording this video, there isn't one. Um, I've just kind of got little tiny bits like this. In fact, I can put a card up in the right hand corner. I've got another uh, portrait of my daughter. Um, where she's standing on a hillside. And I'll put that link up in the corner here in case you want to see that one uh, because her hair is blonde. So that will give you some tips of uh, how I did some blonde hair. But for brunette, I go in with a, a raw sienna first and then come over with a burnt sienna. And you know, if the brunette that you're working on is a slightly different shade, then of course you just adjust your pigments accordingly. And uh, since baby hair is a lot of uh, uh, little pieces of hair coming down, that's what I'm trying to paint is the sections of hair. I'm not trying to paint individual hairs at all. Let's talk about eyebrows for just a very quick second. These are so small and all we need to do is just kind of fill them in. The eyebrow sits at that bone that is the top of your eye ridge. So if you can feel on your face, the eye socket that you have, the top of that eye socket is where the eyebrows are. So the forehead will jut out a little bit there and then uh, 
inside the eye, it's, it's kind of recessed a little bit. So uh, kind of uh, judge where that part on the brow is going to be when you place your, your, uh, your eyebrows. And now I'm going in with uh, a little bit of that darker color, the, the mix, uh, the, excuse me, the, the black mix. And I just kind of put in a suggestion of the, of the eyes there and some eyelashes. And now I'm going to go in with uh, some of that purple mix and define the area around my nose. And for the mouth, I'm going to go in with some alizarin crimson. Now I'm taking off a little piece there uh, because I had some trouble with the lips. Um, I just want to go in with this alizarin crimson and it kept, it was just continually too watery. I, I needed to find a, find a portion of my pan there that's really uh, quite thick because it's so small and I didn't want it to flow at all. Um, in this case, the top lip is so thin but the bottom lip on babies, that's something else that you can remember. It kind of pooches out. It kind of um, has that nice roundness to it, that fullness. So all of these features of children are just a little bit more exaggerated. The, the nose is up. The cheeks are fuller. The chin sticks out a little bit more. The forehead sticks out. And all of these things you can certainly highlight by, uh, by painting them red. Uh, that uh, tells us that there's more blood in that area, that that's uh, an area that uh, comes to the forefront to uh, help shape the characteristic of, of who it is we're painting. As we finalize some of the shadows on the face to give it those final bits of shape, I'm using the purple section of my skin tone mix there, and that's over in my palette, the second, well, it's on the right side, it's the second one down from the top. Uh, so you can see in that mix there, I've got the browner side over to the left and the purple, the more purple side over to the right. This is why I don't like to mix my, my paints completely every single time because then I can reach exactly where I need. So what I've done with that, uh, the cheek and chin shadow, is I went into the purple side, left a line of pigment, and then came back with some water and just use that to distribute it around. And now we've got that dry completely. And I'm going to go in now with this number eight brush and kind of lift off some highlights. In looking at uh, the way that I painted the face and in looking at the reference photo, I've noticed that there's a few more places on the face that are a little bit highlighted and I kind of lost those in the painting. So here's how we correct that. We're gonna come back in with a wet brush and just paint over the area that you want to highlight and we're going to lift that off. I think this is just the best tip in the world for, uh, for portraiture because what happens when you do this is you get these beautiful soft edges and the transitions are imperceptible. They really help to uh, impart the delicate nature of skin by using the lifting off technique. Now I'm happy with the face and I want to go back and revisit these snow pants just a little bit. So I'm back into that puddle that I mixed for the snow pants and I'm re-accentuating the shadows. I just really want to give these a little bit more oomph and then we can go on to look at the other shadow details and make sure we've got those just the way we want them. Now it's time to add the shadows at the bottom. Uh, I didn't want to look like I was floating in space. so. <laughs> This is how we anchor our subject. We're going to add the shadows by going into that dark mix and painting very carefully around the bottom edge. Now I am assuming in my painting that the sun is shining at the top of the back of my head, which is pretty much the way it was in the photo. Um, I'm creating a little bit of an odd edge on the shadow over there in front because uh, Lucinda's head is round and my hand is kind of uh, on the side there. So that would kind of cast a slightly different shadow. Now that I've got that first layer down, I can go in where it's wet on that first layer and drop in a stronger mix of pigment and that will help to darken that shadow. Whenever we're working with shadows, remember the part that touches the ground is where the shadow is the darkest. So I'm going in with a very thick uh, dose of pigment here and letting it migrate on that wet area. I can even come back in with a wet brush and help to spread that around. Little things like this really do help to soften the shadow, just give it kind of a, a more delicate nature. And remember, wherever you put water on your paper, that will give your watercolor a path to travel. So you can really create some soft nuances and effects by using these techniques. Now I am finished with this one and I just realized I got a drop of water in there so I'll blot that off and I'm going to sign it and date it and as always I will remind you to do the same because even if you're just working in your journal you really do want to have that date there. You want to, other people who come after you to know that you're the one who painted it and that date is going to tell you where you were in your art journey on that day. So I'm titling this one Me and Lucinda March 6th 
1966. And I hope that all of you really enjoy looking down your own memory lanes and finding a subject to paint this week. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye now.